friend Bat at Dark Knight Studios. That's D A R K N Y T E Studios.com. You can follow him on all of his social media. He makes all of my podcast shirts and my logos for Down the Road Show and Murdoch Worldwide Entertainment and Chronicles of Comic Con. He is my go to graphic arts designer that I've been using for the last seven years. And my best friend and brother in life. Love you so much, Bat. Uh, I am excited moving forward with the audio version of the Down the Road Show podcast to have on this next guest today. I'm going to let him introduce himself because I met him on the green room where we're recording this live. Uh, and he is just an amazing human being, activist, spiritual leader, and just great person to talk to when it comes to all things cannabis. Paul, how are you doing today, Paul? <laughs> Casey, I'm doing great. How about yourself? I'm doing great. Uh, uh, back's a little sore from doing Cannabis Church on Sunday and sitting in my chair to do that. But you know what? It, it's worth it. I I enjoy that Sunday service. So, uh, <laughs> which you helped inspire me wanting to do that. So thank you wow. for that. Wow. Well, thank you. I uh, I am. Really, just um, encouraged by the the next wave of activists that I've I've met. Um, many of many of you I've just re- met recently here on Green Room and, and Clubhouse, um, and you know it just is really um, encouraging to see that um, people are are bringing fresh energy to this. Uh, this healing because it really is um, absolutely critical that everybody does what they can at this particular moment. It's a very pivotal time in, uh, in, in the, in the process. But um, as far as, as, as myself uh, in terms of introducing myself, I've, I've been a cannabis scholar for 30 years. I've been, uh, making films and, and writing and uh, teaching people about cannabis um, from Hawaii to uh, the Persian Gulf <laughs> and um, just am still involved with product development and trying to help to coordinate the industry in a way that is going to maximize the Gaia therapeutic benefit of it, the earth healing benefit of uh, the, the plant and essentially recognizing cannabis as mankind's functional interface with the natural order, because that's really what uh, it seems to be from, from what I can tell. Um, I wrote a book entitled Cannabis Versus Climate Change and made a film by the t- same title, uh, cannabis versus climate change. You can find that on Vimeo and um, have participated in the drug policy reform effort um, in Europe and um, in the United States in various ways. Um, worked with the uh, uh, NCOD in Europe and um, Hemp the Climate in uh, Czech Republic and um, other, uh, the World Hemp Congress in Slovenia, I've presented five times uh, at the World Hemp Congress in Slovenia, and um, and continue to network with people around the world to advance our uh, proper understanding of, of what cannabis can do and, and why it's so important for us to to acknowledge that it's unique in its ability to uh, heal the Earth's atmosphere in the time that we may have left to make a difference. So that's that's why I'm here. <laughs> Is that-, that that's a pretty good summary. That's a great that's a great starting point for uh, that. Does not wrap up all things that are Paul. That is for sure. Uh, <laughs> I think you're one of the first people I heard talking about. Uh, the terpenes from, you know, the piney terpenes from uh, the plant helping protect the atmosphere. So, uh, yeah, 
So <laughs> let where did all this begin with Paul? Like you, you've told you, I've heard your story, but you know, a lot of people are hearing this for the first time. Uh, when you first decided to plant the holy cannabis plant on public land. <laughs> well, that was back in 1991. Uh, at the time I was living in Hawaii, I was the director for Sea Shepherd in Hawaii. And I uh, learned that you could make fuel from the cannabis plant. And I realized that, well, if you can make fuel from from cannabis, that's that's the real reason for marijuana being illegal. I mean, the marijuana industry is a multi-billion dollar industry, but the, the fuel industry is a multi-trillion dollar industry. And so I uh, handed Sea Shepherd over to a friend of mine and I started Project Peace. And the first thing that I did um, as the director for Project Peace was I followed George Bush senior around Pearl Harbor <laughs> for the 50th anniversary of the bombing of Pearl Harbor uh, with a copy of Jack Harris book, The Emperor Wears No Clothes, and uh, a sign that read, you can't honor the dead by ignoring the living. And so after that, uh, on January 1st, 1992, uh, I planted cannabis publicly under the banyan tree in Lahaina. Uh, with Roger Christie, uh, my friend from the Big Island, who, who came over. And you can see us planting uh, in my film, Cannabis Versus Climate Change, uh, features our, our, uh, our planting uh, in 1992. And then in 93, I planted again on the steps of the state capitol in Sacramento in California, which is the state where I was born, and challenged the rightful jurisdiction of the court over any herb bearing seed that is both unique and essential. And as it turns out, cannabis has been federally recognized as a strategic resource that is available by essential civilian demand. So I have been exercising essential civilian demand for 30 years and demanding that the government take responsibility for the true value of cannabis as being both unique and essential. And um, yeah, explain that, explain that, that further for people that don't know exactly what essential civilian demand is. Well, essential civilian demand is an emergency preparedness protocol that affords access to strategic resources that people need in times of uh, emergency preparedness. And cannabis is, uh, nutritionally, cannabis is both unique and essential in providing all of the essential fatty acids and proteins that uh, people need to thrive, actually. Cannabis is unique in having all of the essential fatty acids in proper proportion for long-term consumption, as well as all of the essential amino acids uh, in meaningful quantities and other uh, nutritional components that are essential to optimum health. And so cannabis, if, if you're not growing cannabis for seed right now, then you are food insecure because cannabis is one of the few uh, crops that is uh, going to be able to grow in the climate conditions that we can anticipate uh, in the future. And it's important for people to anticipate the changing uh, climate conditions and plan accordingly. And that means having access to fresh, fertile cannabis seed uh, so that you don't starve to death <laughs> and also uh, to produce clean cellulosic hydrogen energy. So cannabis is essential uh, for uh, several reasons. Um, one of the main reasons is that um, cannabis is the only crop that produces complete nutrition and <clears throat> clean energy from the same harvest. So uh, essential civilian demand is an accelerated federal protocol that we, the people, can implement in order to gain access to something that we need. 
uh, in order to to uh, weather the the coming uh, conditions of uh, increased um, UVB radiation, which is uh, a greater threat to our uh, our existence than 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 even the global warming. Um, the increased UVB radiation is what I write about as uh, the global broiling. The uh, B in UVB stands for broil, and <laughs> it's cooking the planet right now. Right. Yeah, it's 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 uh, drying out the soil. It's uh, drying out the vegetation. It's uh, impacting uh, immune response. It's affecting uh, genetic mutation. Uh, UVB is a really bad really bad stuff and and you know the fact that it's increasing is is not uh debatable the data is not uh ambiguous at all the uvb is increasing and um you know the geoengineering schemes that are being proposed are um not um adequate to uh the task of dealing with the increasing uvb but cannabis agriculture is and so it's important to recognize that cannabis agriculture is the most uh efficient and uh, uh time efficient way to uh mitigate the increasing uvb radiation and we need to do that because of the terpenes the, the terpenes that uh the boreal forests and the marine phytoplankton used to produce um, are produced in volume in quantity by cannabis. And because the boreal forests and the marine phytoplankton have been uh, reduced by about half of, uh, of what there, there was even just 60 years ago, twice the UVB radiation is making it through to the surface of the planet. And because cannabis is the only crop that produces the volume of terpenes needed to replenish the atmosphere and shield the planet against the UVB radiation, then we need to recognize that we need to plant as much cannabis as we can, as fast as we can, and pray it's not too late. That's the situation we're in right now. Yeah, no kidding. Uh, yeah, cannabis can save us all. Preach, Brother Paul. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm well, looking at the stage right now, and I just realized we have two two ministers and one bishop up here right now. So <laughs> that's kind of cool. Uh, uh, so, yeah, how, how did you get in touch with your spiritual side of cannabis and decide to start a ministry? Well, I um, recognized that the spiritual dimensions of agriculture were completely um, overlooked in, uh, in the, the conversation around cannabis and the fact that cannabis isn't just useful for people. Cannabis is useful for all the creatures of this planet uh, in one way or another. And um, for some of them, that have a symbiotic relationship with the plant, um, cannabis is, is critically essential for their health and well-being. And so, you know, my orientation to, to spirituality is, is just, uh, it's a secular, non-religious orientation. It's just recognizing that nature is um, the representation of uh, the, the, the creator spirit on this planet whatever you want to call that uh, some people call it god some people call it uh shiva or buddha or whatever i mean uh you know whatever that uh creator spirit is um in 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 people's religion um it's consistent in having given us all of the the things uh in nature for us to work with and to arbitrarily remove one of these uh, these uh, uh, resources, one of these uh, natural gifts from the creator spirit, is not within <laughs> the rightful jurisdiction of any court. 
because um, you know we were given these things by virtue of being born into a world that is um, you know a, a functional ongoing process and we don't understand that process well enough to start <laughs> removing pieces of it it's like taking you know a carburetor out of an engine <laughs> and expecting the engine to run you know <laughs> it's just it's just um irresponsible and so you know what has happened over the last 83 years is that um our social evolution has carried us into dysfunction because the free market economy was not allowed to operate. Cannabis was removed from the free market economy and the toxic resources that uh, filled the, 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 the void created by this critically important resource being removed um, have brought us to the brink of extinction. You know, the, the, the fossil fuels wouldn't have been able to compete with cannabis fuels <laughs> just flat out uh, obsolete as soon as cannabis is reintroduced back into the energy production equation. Because, you know, first of all, people can't eat energy, okay? And so if you have a, a crop that produces complete nutrition and clean energy from the same harvest, which cannabis does, then that immediately <laughs> eliminates competition from any energy production process that doesn't provide nutrition. And uh, so it's pretty obvious to me anyway that um, no other energy production method or process can compete with cannabis, um, even in conditions of global balance. I mean, the, the fact that uh, the environment is out of balance just um, intensifies the, the need for a crop that produces clean energy, complete nutrition, and also heals Earth's atmosphere which cannabis is unique in, in being able to do because it produces the atmospheric aerosol terpenes that refract the solar radiation away from the planet. And it also produces uh, an abundance of oxygen and um, sequesters uh, more carbon than any other agricultural resource in less time than any other crop. So, you know, the, 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 the rationale uh, for identifying cannabis as unique in its ability to heal Earth's atmosphere, soil, water, air, and wildlife is uh, a compelling uh, rationale that really can't be uh, debated. It, there's, there's just nothing else that does all of the things that cannabis does. And uh, it would certainly make it a lot easier if there, if there were <laughs> right, <laughs> right now, you know, I mean, it, it makes us sound kind of fanatical when we say, well, look, there's only one way to fix this, you know, and, and of course people will immediately tell you that there is no silver bullet, but you know, the fact is that um, there is a silver bullet. It's just that it's, it's not silver. It's green. <laughs> yes. It's a green bullet. Yeah. Nice. You know? Yeah. You know, and if somebody has a better idea, you know, I'll, I'll I'll work on their idea for free for the rest of my life. But in 30 years of trying to heal this planet, um, I haven't seen anything that even comes close to, to cannabis and its ability to do everything that needs to be done in the time that we may have left to make a difference. And, you know. When you recognize time as the limiting factor in the equation of survival, then it just makes it that much more uh, important for us to to focus on on what needs to be done and and to get it done. Because right now we we've, we've just lost another uh, growing season. Uh, we should have been planting a lot more cannabis than we have, but um, you know 
we uh, can start harvesting the feral hemp seed in the Midwest and and uh, locating the you know land race strains that uh, we need uh, to propagate in order to uh, expand the arable base of this planet so that we can uh, you know, increase the carrying capacity uh, to accommodate the nine billion people that are going to be here in a few years you know? and, and cannabis is really the only way to do that so um, you know it's important for us to be to be clear well and you so we've covered the healing aspect of the planet and we've covered that it's a healing aspect when it comes to food so we may as well get to the medicine portion of cannabis like it is a healing medicine for many people what do you use it for well, I um, I started as uh, most most people as a as a recreational cannabis user, and um, I didn't realize at the time that um, it was also helping me to end my uh, alcohol dependence, and so though I didn't realize that I was using cannabis to wean myself off of alcohol, um, it kind of was serving that function um, for years um, where I reduced my alcohol intake considerably um, when I started using cannabis. And eventually, um, when I was... 28 years old, I broke my neck in a hang glider crash and started using cannabis to uh, deal with the residual uh, neuralgia and muscle spasticity that resulted from, from that crash. And so um, over the years, I have come to appreciate cannabis for its ability to uh, mitigate the uh, PTSD and the, the, the what I call pre-TSD uh, that I suffer from uh, in doing the uh, environmental work uh, that I've done uh, at, when I was uh, the director for Sea Shepherd, um, just learning of, of the the abuse of, of dolphins and whales and other sea creatures um was was really uh brutal i mean it, if you are empathic with other uh creatures as i am and have, have spent thousands of hours in the ocean with uh many different uh types of uh sea creatures um you know you you develop uh, kinship with uh, other species that are much more evolved <laughs> than human beings. I mean, dolphins and whales have lived on this planet for 35 million years in the form that we know them today. And so you know, my association with uh, those creatures um, is is more than just um, uh, a, you know, a, a, a separate uh, uh, sort of um, disconnected appreciation for them. I've spent time with them. I've, I've have uh, shared energy with dolphins and whales, and so um, for me, cannabis also helps me to. Um, you know, deal with the the injustice that um, we were born into, all of us, where the things that are are not right uh, have become uh, impacted and difficult to change. And so, you know, it takes a certain amount of uh, resilience <laughs> to be uh, an activist for an extended period of time. You have to uh, recognize that. You know, your energy ebbs and flows, uh, or ebbs and, 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 
you know, builds and, and it, it's, uh, it's, it's difficult to maintain uh, a positive outlook and cannabis really does help me to uh, persevere through the frustration and uh, aggravation <laughs> of the what I perceive to be um, time wasted and um, the the um, compounding uh, harms of prohibition that seems so obvious um, that um, really take their toll. And so I use cannabis in a number of different ways. I still have residual uh, muscle spasticity and neuralgia from the hang glider crash and, and other crashes <laughs> that I've, uh, I've endured. But, um, you know, for me, a lot of what cannabis does is just to help me to um, avoid the aging process. I just think that um, I, I've managed to achieve the ripe old age of 66 in, in a, uh, a configuration, physical configuration that uh, defies uh, the normal aging process. I should be uh, in a lot worse shape than I am. And um, I have to assume that my lifelong use of cannabis has contributed to that because I've seen it in other people. My, my friends who use cannabis are also in, uh, in a better shape than my friends who don't. So, um, you know, all of those things. Well, and, <clears throat> and so now... Here you are, you're 66, so you've lived a life of activism for cannabis, and some people may be listening to this and being like, okay, this is just some old hippie shit, but no, uh, now you're a father, so this is about saving the planet for the future for your son. Well, yeah, and, you know, I mean, 30 years ago when I started doing this, I was, I was, 35 years old and I was aware that you know there were people who hadn't been born yet and animals who hadn't been born yet or who couldn't speak for themselves who needed somebody to stand up for them and to look out for them and so in a sort of abstract way 30 years ago I started speaking for those who cannot speak for themselves and now, 30 years later, I've got a 14-year-old son who can speak for himself. But um, his being here has taken something that was an abstract for me and made it very real. And anyone who has uh, children or who is committed to protecting children can tell you that um, – there's no more powerful <laughs> motivation than that. And, you know, defense of children is something that is just instinctual, uh, whether there are children or not. But when you have a child, um, it becomes very personal. And when my son was born is when I started my ministry. And I um, wanted to uh, codify the uh, the um, spiritual dimensions of my relationship with cannabis and recognizing that um, you know when you take on um, the status quo it is a spiritual uh, activity because the status quo is the antithesis of uh, spirituality. The, we were born into what I refer to as a Gaiacidal system, an earth killing system where toxins somehow uh, were deemed valuable <laughs> rather than poison. <laughs> and 
you know, it be, it was okay to burn uh, fossil fuels, uh, even though we knew that they were toxic to people and animals and the planet itself. And so, you know, for me, it, the um, the spiritual dimensions of cannabis include its um, ability to connect us with the life force that uh, connects all living things on this planet that uh, makes the the statement we are one meaningful you know and so you know just recognizing that systemic connection between all living things is something that um, includes cannabis and leads to respect for nature as uh, a guiding uh, principle. And when you expand your understanding of respect for nature to include not just, you know, not harming nature, not, not, not carrying down the, the natural relationships, but also um, acknowledging the true value of what nature offers us in terms of looking at the cannabis plant and seeing something that is both unique and essential and therefore worthy of much more respect than it's been afforded during our lifetimes. And understanding that that respect for nature is, uh, is critical to our recovery of homeostasis and balance um, that has been um, uh, disrupted by our disrespect for nature and the absence of regard for the systems that, that keep us alive. And so, you know, it's time for us to, to recover that balance and that respect. And a good place to start is to identify cannabis as mankind's functional interface with the natural order. Because without cannabis, our species will never achieve sustainable existence on this planet. It's just too essential to uh, repairing the the ecosystem and also to uh, providing Gaia therapeutic industry. Oh, wow. Yes, man. I love you, Paul. <laughs> Every single word you just said. So <laughs> true. That rings true. Uh, you, you got a question, Damien or Angelo, either of you guys want to jump in? Hey, it's Damien. How are you, Paul? Hey, Damien. Good. Good to see you. Hey, Angelo. Good to see you. Thanks, Casey. Thanks for uh, looping me in. Um, Paul, I'm actually in my garden right right now. So listening to what you're saying, my, my plants are listening to what you're <laughs> saying. They're happy. They're nodding along. Um, I'm curious if you... I'm, I'm, how do I word this? I don't mean to sound defensive. <laughs> Cannabis and co-planting, cannabis and flower gilding, cannabis and permaculture. Can you speak more to those ideas about how it's not just necessarily all of the great things that you've talked about that cannabis directly gives us, but how it can help with pollinators and help other plants and, and be just a total sort of like healing thing, even for our gardens and our micro sort of, um, you know, I'm on a farm in Vermont, so I'm very lucky to be able to grow most of the produce that I eat, but I'm definitely looking to put cannabis in the garden and trying to figure out a way to do it. Um, that, that follows those permaculture principles versus that sort of agricultural method of just rows of cannabis. Does that make sense? Yeah, it really does, Damien. And, um, you know, this is one of the things that I think is the most overlooked um, uh, aspect of of prohibition is the impact it has had on um, organic agriculture and organic gardening, because cannabis is a, an extremely valuable tool. Uh, it's an agronomic uh, 
miracle <laughs> for our gardens. And when you remove cannabis from our gardens, then all of the benefits that cannabis brings in relation to growing other plants um, is lost. And the memory of it has been lost. And things like biogenic pesticides that do not persist in the environment, that don't uh, uh, toxify the hydrologic cycle, are incredibly important um, for uh, organic farming and gardening and making the uh, extracts from the cannabis plant that can help us to uh, grow other crops is part of what is being rediscovered now that people have access to the plant and the companion planting of cannabis or the rotational cropping of cannabis in order to uh, you know, mitigate pest infestations and, um, and weed uh, problems. Um, you know, all of these things are part of the holistic uh, agricultural orientation to uh, cannabis and other crops that, that offer these, these um, advantages to, to gardeners that um, can help to make farmers and gardeners independent of any kind of inputs uh, that, that don't come from <laughs> their farms. That's biodynamic agriculture is the type of uh, gardening that I practice. And, and part of biodynamic agriculture is having an autonomous uh, system within your own farm. And so um, the, the, the use of cannabis as, uh, for example, um, to uh, eliminate the uh, uh, infestation uh, by, um, oh geez, I'm sorry, <laughs> I just escaped. Uh, nematodes, the nematode uh, in the soil uh, can either be beneficial or uh, problematic. And the, the beneficial nematodes are encouraged by cannabis rotations and uh, uh, harmful nematodes are discouraged by cannabis uh, uh, rotations. And so the, currently the conventional uh, way of, of dealing with nematodes is through the injecting methyl bromide into the soil, which <laughs> kills everything in the soil and also uh, is a, uh, a very persistent uh, greenhouse gas. And so just being able to replace methyl bromide with a combination of uh, cannabis rotations and uh, even potentially injecting the, the terpenes uh, from cannabis into the soil if necessary to, to uh, kill uh, pests uh, such as cutworms, and nematodes. Um, you know, these are uh, agricultural techniques that um, are just now becoming available. And so, you know, the, the necessity of identifying the environmental benefits of reintroduction of cannabis is something that can be translated into um, uh, economic uh, incentives and um, you know the the reward for uh, conversion from diocidal practices to diatherapeutic practices in uh, farming and gardening is something that um, needs to have economic incentives associated with it in order to overcome the inertia of the the current uh, of the status quo so did that answer your question or, or did that speak to what what you're talking about damien 
Yeah, absolutely. And, um, you know, just understanding that, like, cannabis truly does so much for just about everything it comes into contact with is, is what it seems. Right. And so, yeah, um, like you're saying, like being able to introduce cannabis back into just regular large scale farms or, or produce, right. Uh, hopefully we get away from large scale farming. That's my goal. But um, you know, if we can get it back towards the just, nature knows nature knows what to do we just need to let it do its thing <laughs> and, yeah and, you know trying to figure out what do we know that already goes well with cannabis like how can we give it how can we set up a, a small like micro climate or micro ecosystem to give it its best chance well one of the things that i recommend that people do is that they set up uh, beehives in proximity to their cannabis uh, garden or, or farm because bees seem to have a symbiotic relationship with cannabis. Just uh, from, from what I have observed in the, in the gardens that I've set up next to, to beehives, um, the bees have a, a, a very specific affinity for cannabis. I, uh, on my Twitter page, I have a, a little film <laughs> that, I have pinned uh, to my Twitter uh, page that's called Bee Bath, and it shows uh, uh, a bee in my in my marijuana garden uh, rubbing itself down from antenna to stinger with uh, cannabis resin. And I've observed this in other uh, gardens and have long thought that bees and cannabis have a symbiotic relationship. But this little film was the first time I was able to document it. And so it's really fascinating to watch this little bee rubbing himself down with cannabis resin. And, you know, just, I mean, the, the, the hive that I set up in France um, was uh, doing very well. And um, it was during a time when the colony collapse disorder in France was, was epidemic. And my, my hive did not suffer any colony collapse. I did not have any bee die off. And in fact, I had to, I, I mean, I gave uh, bees back to the guy who gave me my bees originally because his bees died and mine didn't. And the only difference between his bees and my bees was <clears throat> my, my bees um, were, had access to cannabis. And so, you know, there is a lot of, um, of objectivity that is lacking in our uh, understanding of the role that cannabis plays. Uh, and it is really important for us to understand that um, that lack of objectivity is um, influencing policy and, you know, that, that obsolete reefer madness that was imposed on us before we were even born persists to this day. And, um, you know, it's, we just don't have time for it. <laughs> you know, it's, it's being used against us and, and continues to influence uh, policy uh, decisions but, you know, the fact is it's all based on the great lie of 1937 that says THC is bad for the human body. And, you know, now we know we have an endogenous cannabinoid system that actually requires THC to function properly. So, um, you know, the, the scheduling of cannabis has not uh, responded to the science. And that's where. Um, you know, we are really um, uh, just living in a dysfunctional society, and we have to overcome that dysfunction uh, by demanding access to cannabis, and that's where essential civilian demand comes in. So, um, yeah, I, that's just the way I see it. I, I'm hoping that 
that's going to, to kick in. Um, I haven't seen it happen yet in, in terms of, from, from what I understand um, from Sam Cannon in London, who is trying to uh, introduce cannabis versus climate change into the COP26 conversation in November. Um, the UN isn't open to it, and we've been excluded from COP26. So, you know, it, one would hope that we're further along than we are, but from what I can tell, it's still um, really just um, – uh, we're, we're still in a very primitive, primitive state of understanding in terms of the, the value of this plant. Yeah. And, and, and that's, that there is lies the great debate on how we get through to the politicians, uh, to move cannabis legislation, uh, forward in the proper way, uh, especially with our voices being heard, uh, and being seen when it comes to helping make the legislation since we actually know what we're talking about. Well, I don't think legislation is going to do it, Casey. I think, you know, the, the, the economic uh, control of our government is so uh, intractable that it's going to take a demand to overcome the prohibition uh, of it. I, I mean, I've been doing this for 30 years and, you know, people have talked about uh, needing more studies or, you know, being uh, uh accepting of the incremental nature of change. And, you know, I've heard a lot of uh, arguments uh, uh, over the years, and none of them are um, really relevant in the context of the global extinction that we face incremental change in the context of, <laughs> of, uh, you know, two degrees centigrade, um, is just, it doesn't make any sense. And so, um, because there is a federal protocol that is available, it's never been defeated <laughs> because it's never been tried. Um, I think essential civilian demand really is um, is the only way that we're going to make it in time. I don't think I don't think legislation is is going to to happen uh, in a timely way, just because the the economics is too strong against it. You know, I mean, look at what Biden is doing in terms of approving you know these uh, you know pipelines and and um, arranging deals you know, for fracking and, and tar sands. And, you know, it's just, it's, we're being misled. We're being bullshitted. And we have to be real about that. Amen. Yeah. <clears throat> so we need to get out there and demand, demand, demand. No, no longer ask for permission. Well, I think what it's going to take is I think it's going to take, uh, you know, um, uh, uh, a cross section of humanity to um, coordinate uh, a formal exercise of demand. I think it's a uh, something that needs to be carried out at the state level. Um, for example, in Oregon, uh, where I live, um, Ron Wyden is the senator who is the most fully engaged in the hemp industry. And he and uh, Schumer uh, and um, Cory Booker have introduced the, the federal uh, legalization uh, bill that is probably going to not go anywhere. I mean, from what I have read, the, the odds of it passing are very slim. But, um, you know, the fact that they have introduced it is a uh, uh, a sort of foot in the door for the rest of us who could then come in with essential civilian demand and say, 
okay, you know, you guys had your chance to pass this legislatively and you didn't do it. And now, because, you know, we're looking at next planting season, 2000, you know, 22, <laughs> um, you know, we have to anticipate um, what needs to be done next year because we missed it this year. And so um, essential civilian demand for ending the THC limits on seeded industrial hemp is a very specific demand. And if we just were able to grow as much hemp for seed and stocks as we wanted to without being threatened with having our uh, harvest destroyed, then we could attract the funding for the processing infrastructure needed to produce cellulosic hydrogen and complete nutrition from the same harvest. Those, you know, by next year, we need to be in a position to uh, produce our cellulosic hydrogen from our stems, not just from the industrial hemp, but also from the marijuana, the high THC uh, recreational or medicinal strains, uh, those stems need to be collected and, and processed uh, into energy also, because otherwise they just sit in the field and uh, produce greenhouse gases. And so our industry needs to be responsible for its waste stream and ma make sure that there is no waste stream to our industry because our industry is unique in uh, being uh, a zero waste industry if we uh, design it to be that. And so those are the things that um, substantiate the demand. When you point out that cannabis is the only crop that produces complete nutrition and clean energy from the same harvest, at the same time that it heals our atmosphere, and helps purify the water, then you know you can also start adding <laughs> the other environmental considerations and benefits of cannabis industry that are going to uh, take pressure off of the the forests to produce paper and take pressure off of the oceans to provide protein and you know all of those those uh, uh, parallel uh, effects of reintroducing cannabis all add up to being able to solve several problems at the same time. And that's really key, uh, you know, to recovering uh, because time is the limiting factor. You know, if, if you're solving several problems at the same time, <laughs> then you're essentially expanding uh, time by making better use of it. And so that, that's what we need to do is we need to recognize all those integrated uh, dynamics and, and coordinate our response to the, the conditions that we're facing. That's what I think. So, so in a, in a perfect world, we get our essential civilian demand going and we get the government to recognize it. Where do you see cannabis industry, cannabis and hemp industry, and us as a society in five or ten years? Well, I see us um, focusing on seed production and stem production and increasing the uh, ability of farmers and gardeners all over the world um, by providing them with uh, seed stock that will do well in their uh, soil and climate and photo period conditions. And we coordinate the distribution of hemp seed throughout the world so that people have what they need to help themselves. And by doing that, we will expand the arable base because people will start using cannabis in uh, places where other crops won't grow because cannabis is uh, a non-invasive pioneer crop. It can be used to expand the arable base and increase the carrying capacity of the planet. 
and regenerate the damaged soils and the marginal lands. And we can shift from uh, gaiacidal industry to Gaia therapeutic industry and shift from a scarcity based society to an abundance based society. And cannabis is uniquely qualified to achieve that because it grows so abundantly and produces so many different products from the same harvest. Um, I mean, just from one harvest, you can count uh, the seed production. So there's the food, um, the the stem production that <laughs> potentially can uh, be thousands of different products. But um, let's just say uh, your stems are going to go to produce energy. So you, the seeds go that way to produce food and the stems go that way to produce energy. And then you have all this flower material uh, that's neither stems nor seeds. So the flowers can be rendered into uh, herbal therapeutics. They can be rendered into um, uh, uh, building materials and um, different uh, uh, products related to agriculture. For example, the, 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 the flower, once it's been uh, had the, the CBD extracted from it, is a material called raffinate and raffinate uh, can be used to produce other uh, products um, that include, um, for example, just one example, uh, people are now using the raffinate uh, instead of the, uh, the, the uh, fiberglass growing cubes, the uh, rock wool uh, growing cubes. Um, are being replaced by raffinate growing cubes, which eliminates a, a huge uh, uh, waste, uh, toxic waste product from the, the industry. The, the rock wool cubes are just, um, they're a, a hazardous material that um, is, is really um, in need of, of being eliminated completely from our industry and the raffinate has a potential to do that. So um, I, that's where I see it going. I see the, the potential for cannabis industry to make uh, fossil fuels, nuclear energy and the military industrial complex itself obsolete because when you eliminate the need to fight over, unevenly distributed resources, then you eliminate the need for the military industrial complex as we know it. So from, from armies to, to farmers. <laughs> <that's> <laughs> nice. Yeah. And, yeah. and, and, and whole plant usage. And, and you make a very valid point about how useful the entire plant is and being able to know what you're harvesting it for and uh, being able to utilize it in all the different commodities for sure. Yeah. Um, uh, any other questions from uh, this wonderful panel of humans up here, Angelo or Damien, you got anything else for Paul? No further questions. Just always a pleasure, Paul. Thank you for sharing your, your wealth of knowledge and, um, experience like your story uh just every time i i feel like i learned something new and and i'm drawn in more and more so just thanks so much for sharing and um you know taking the time to to really share your story in a way that um hopefully the rest of us can can amplify it and and really get this message out and heard so just thank you again um it's always a pleasure to to come into any space where you're Thank you, Damien. Uh, thanks, Casey and Angelo, for, for uh, showing up today. And um, if you haven't seen my film, Cannabis Versus Climate Change, on Vimeo, um, <laughs> I encourage you to go and, and check it out because, um, I mean, th there's too much of me in it. You know, I, I wound up filming myself over 30 years uh, uh, several times. And so, 
Um, one of the kind of interesting things about the film for me is just seeing, you know, myself age <laughs> over 30 years of, of doing this work. And what that, what that does for me, uh, aside from <laughs> just depressing the, the fuck out of me is, um, it, it shows that, um, you know, the, the trajectory of time that it, you know, it's taken, uh, to get through, um, to where we are and just, I mean, I think it's kind of hard for people who haven't spent 30 years doing this to kind of even imagine spending 30 years doing this. I mean, I couldn't imagine it when I started, I thought it would be over in five years, but, um, you know, just that it's taken 30 years, um, to get to where we are right now, I think is important for people to, to, to regard and to, to look at that and say, okay, well, we don't have another 30 years. <laughs> Everybody agrees. We don't have another 30 years to, to argue this. And so, you know, if, if my spending 30 years doing this, uh, can help to shorten the trajectory, uh, from here on out, then there's, I think, some some value in in what I've done, and um, I'm really hoping that 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 people get that. You know, we don't have uh, 30 more years to debate this, and the fact that that conditions have de deteriorated to the extent that they have, just in the 30 years that I've been doing this, um, is really um, is is a wake up call you know um that uh you know even 10 years ago we we weren't having the types of you know raging fires that we're having now for example even 10 years ago and um you know so the fact that we've lost all this time already is is very obvious um you know the the condition of the environment is such that people can see we have to to do things differently and so i'm hoping that you know people will say okay this guy was right 30 years ago you know you can see him there planting pot publicly 30 years ago and now you know, he's right about this essential civilian demand stuff. And so, you know, I mean, I, I don't take any pleasure in being right unless it helps to uh, advance b us beyond where we're, we seem to be stuck. stuck. And so, um, you know, for what it's worth, um, you know, check out my film. And try to imagine yourself <laughs> doing doing this for 30 years, <laughs> and um, hopefully that will motivate us all to 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 push past this this uh, resistance that I've been. I mean, I've been swimming against this tide uh, most of my adult life, and um, I'm ready to 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 break through to to the, the fun part where we all start, you know, making uh, clean energy and, um, you know, recognizing the, the, the benefits of being right rather than just having to convince other people all the time that we are right about what we're saying. So anyway, um, yeah, check out my film. Yeah, uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna was... put a direct link for everyone to find your film directly from this podcast. Uh, make it easy. Ah, but cool. where can Paul tell everyone where they can get a hold of your book? Well, my book is available on Amazon, uh, Cannabis versus Climate Change, and um, I have been trying to uh, 
make a Kindle version available uh, for because it's just a lot cheaper to, to get my book uh, in Kindle form. But um, I've been having uh, technical difficulties achieving that. So um, I'm going to try to get that done this week. But uh, Amazon has my book. And um, if people want to, uh, you know, get it at my cost, you can uh, email me your your address and send me 20 bucks, um, which is my cost. And I'll send you a copy of it. And um yeah. And where can they uh, where can they find your Twitter and Instagram and email you? What's the best way? Well, my email is projectpeace at yahoo dot com, and Twitter is at projectpeace, and my Instagram is just my name uh, without my middle initial. <laughs> and um, yeah, that's uh, Twitter, Instagram, email. Um, which is Paul von Hartman for all of you out there that uh, that's right. cannot see his in name ra- on your screen right now <laughs> in radio land. That's right. <laughs> well, Paul, what a pleasure, man. I'm, I'm glad you came and uh, shared all that with you. I know we could go on and on. Uh, you got so many stories and uh, uh, your life is just <laughs> so interesting and uh, just, yeah, uh, I could talk to you forever, but I want to let you get back to your day and your gardening and all that you do. So, yeah. All right, Casey. Well, thanks very much for inviting me. And Damien and Angelo, thanks for, for hanging out, you guys. Um, yeah, and I'll just catch up with you down down the hemp road. <laughs> Thank you, Paul. I have one quick question, if you don't mind. Uh, yeah, sure. Have you ever, uh, like, frozen or freeze your leaves and then, like, made a shake with them? Is there any way, like, yes. to do that? Okay. Yes. Yeah, like, in fact. Like, freeze dry them and then, you know, and then make your smoothie or absolutely uh, whatever you want. Okay, okay. Yep. It actually helps uh, to break down the, the cellulose material uh to freeze them like that and what about the stock you don't really use that for no eating no. purposes is that right that's right yeah okay. it's just too fibrous yeah okay thank you sir really appreciate everything you've done uh you've been an activist longer than i've been alive so truly thank you. <laughs> well thank you angelo well um i think your generation is the one that's going to finally get it done so uh, thank you in, in advance for, for, uh, what it's going to take to, to get this finally over the, over the goal line. Yes, sir. Hopefully let's do that. All right. Well, thank you for everybody for, uh, tuning into the down the road show podcast, uh, <laughs> Angelo and Damien being here live, Paul for being my guest, uh, everyone for tuning in after the fact. Thanks for liking, commenting, subscribing, downloading, whatever it is you do with your favorite podcast. Just thanks for listening, and we will see you all down the road. <laughs>